Hello everyone, I am Bill Harris and welcome to Life Questions, a program that provides biblical perspective to viewer questions about life, questions that you, our viewer, have sent us each week. Now, we forward these questions on to a panel of local ministers to review and research, and those ministers are here with us today to discuss their findings. And they are Pastor Craig Flack of Salina, First Church of God, Pastor Patrick Kamler of Westminster Christian Church, Pastor Randy Davis of The Bridge, and Pastor John Berger of Transform Church. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you all with us today. Good to have you. All right. Now, one of the viewer questions that we got uh, that I'd like to start off with, how do we pray for our administration in Washington, D.C.? I get so mad at them, but I want to remain Christ-like in my thoughts and in my actions. It makes me recall the scripture where Paul says in um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, that we need to pray for those that are in authority. And um, how do we pray? I mean, particularly when somebody's in office we don't like. And then how do we pray when somebody's in office we do like? <laughs> Who wants to tackle that? Start. You start. Everybody, go for it. Everybody's Let's back in the way. Let's, let's dig in. Let's have a good time. Let's have some fun. Well, I, I think what has been helpful for me, and I think this is just a good policy when you're dealing with people in general, especially people you may not necessarily agree with, is to assume positive intent because it becomes more difficult for us to pray for administration, regardless of who they are, if you think that they're concocting some type of evil plan in, in Washington, D.C. And regardless of whether or not that is true, you don't know that. It's only speculation, regardless of what social media tells you. It, it, it goes the same thing of if your guy or your person is in the White House or in Congress or whatever, then you think that everything that they're planning is is for you know your good and for their glory and all this other kind of stuff. And you you have no problem assuming positive intent. So start with that aspect of it and assume that the, the people that are in charge are doing what they think is best for the country. You may disagree with that, and that is your freedom to disagree with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't pray for them. Pray for God to give them the guidance to lead the country the right way. Pray for them to make the right decisions when it comes to whatever the case may be. Uh, you'll still disagree. You'll still have issues with them, most likely how they govern. But at the very least, you are not wasting precious emotional and mental capital thinking how awful this person is and getting yourself kind of worked up. And also make a difference in your own community. Like be concerned about who the mayor in your town is. Be concerned about who the people is that run your school boards and lead your city councils mm -hmm. and do that kind of thing. Politics is local. Mm -hmm. Focus in on that kind of stuff because the person who is you know, passing ordinances in your hometown is gonna carry a lot more weight than whatever's happening <clears throat> in Washington on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, it's funny you say that because I spent the past year and a half on my town school board in Salina. And that was a whole different kind of story. I never ran. I filled an empty term kind of thing, and I'm off now. But my answer changed to this question a lot after serving. Here's how I pray now. Lord, give them wisdom. Yeah. Lord, give them wisdom. Uh, I, if, I would have, if you would have asked me, how can I pray for you as you serve on school board during a pandemic, I would have said, pray that we would have wisdom mm -hmm. because there are so many times where on just the local level of a, a 14,000 person school district, there were no good options. There were no good answers. Now imagine that on a 350 million, 50 state, you know, Congress and you've got the judicial and you've and so if you're thinking the president, I just pray for wisdom now mm -hmm. because no one has enough of it. The scripture says that God gives it when we ask for it. Really? And, and that we should seek it. You know, all the problems, seek wisdom, find her. She is more precious than gold. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's exactly what you said. So really, pray, the, the prayer doesn't even need to be different because if they're on your team, you want them to be wise. Mm -hmm. And if you quote unquote aren't on your team or you maybe disagree with them, you want them to be wise. So for me, my prayer completely changed when I was in it and hoping people were praying for me. And, and I felt the weight of what maybe, you know, one millionth of what some of these politicians might feel of people saying, you have no idea what you're doing. And you're thinking, yeah, sometimes we don't. We need wisdom to know how to best move forward. Do you ever see a situation where sometimes Christians <coughs> perhaps put their hope and trust in an individual politician? And no, I'm, I'm not saying they shouldn't pray for them or that they shouldn't have a, a favorite or whatever. 
But isn't there a situation where when we put our hope and trust in man, we're going to be disappointed every time? Amen. So how do we deal with that? How do we strike a balance in our lives, and our prayer lives for the, for the Christians, rather for the leaders in the I, I would say that's why there are so many critical armchair quarterbacks when it comes to politics, is because people have unduly invested themselves into a political candidate as, they wouldn't say it as such, but as their savior, their hope yeah. for making things better. We're gonna turn this around under the banner of so-and-so's administration. And I think instead of being critical, uh, as you said so aptly, uh, we need to extend grace. I think a posture should be twofold. As Christians, we're called to walk in love towards all people, including those who disagree with us. Isn't that what Jesus mm -hmm. did? Jesus walked in love towards the people, mm -hmm. the very people who crucified them. He died for them. So walking in love is key. Praying for them is key as well. So, uh, you know, when you begin to get irritated or aggravated or offended by what a political personage is doing, pray for them. Pray for wisdom. Pray for, pray for them to have an encounter. I heard you say this many years ago. Pray for this uh, particular candidate to have a legitimate encounter with Jesus Christ because that is the only hope and change and hope for change for anyone, for our nation, is for a person to encounter Jesus and begin to live and walk in his will and his ways. You know, the late but great Billy Graham, I think was a model for everybody. I think he did it right because regardless of who was in the White House, he went in for that, that man in the Oval Office. He went in for his soul. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter what the party was. He right. was about Christ rather than a photo op, you know, or to be identified with one candidate or the other. Is that a model that we should be embracing? You know, I think that the challenge is, 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 is obviously they need wisdom. Uh, they need to have an account with God. But no one man can fix what's messed up the United States. <laughs> right. Because the political parties are still fighting for their own little constituents and their own little whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I just wish there would be a group of, of leaders, men and women, that would raise up and say, what's best for America? period, not just fight for a little small group of people. And yes, nobody should be bullied and picked on. We got to protect those entities. But a lot of what they're fighting for ain't really happening. And it's like you're fixing something that doesn't necessarily need to be fixed and you're letting things break down that we all need for the good of all Americans. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I just think sometimes they're so narrow minded. It's like, Lord, open their eyes and open their hearts, open their ears, you know, because they don't seem to be listening to, to the average person in the United States that really, you know, we need them to get this right. It'll help all of us live a better life. And, and I agree with what you said about locally, uh, because, you know, if we're not involved locally, you shouldn't be griping about globally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know people don't even vote and they sit and gripe and talk politics. First of all, if you don't vote, shame on you. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> get involved. And, and I wish more of our young people that have faith in Christ would get involved in politics today because most people are yeah. avoiding it because it's yeah. so corrupt. Yeah. Folks, the only way it's going to get better is get some good people there in there. Go. There you go. So how are we going to do that? You know, Who are we going to put in office? Who are we going to get locally to, mm -hmm. to help fix a school board? And, and I, boy, I did. I prayed for schools because it sure seemed like they did not know what they were doing, right? <laughs> but the governor kind of told you what you had to do, so you didn't have a choice. And, and you know, the kids suffer for it. Mm -hmm. The teachers suffered. But, you know what, the only way to fix it is get involved and help make it better. In our, in our little town, uh, and I'm not talking out of school, this is of it, we had a city council election, there was five seats up, five people ran. We had a school board election, two seats up, two people ran. Think of all the posts and all the anger and all the people that were frustrated and you need to do this. Think of after this, this school board election was in the fall of 2021. After all we went through and all the things that were said, 14,000 people uh, district, so you probably got maybe what, call it 10,000 eligible citizens that could run over the age 18. Two seats up, two people run. Now I think if you had that posture of how am I gonna get involved, how am I gonna serve, would you, would you have that? Mm -hmm. You probably wouldn't, but even if you're not gonna run, how many people were praying? How many people genuinely were before the Lord and being an encourager right. and those kinds of things? It, it really does matter. What about an outreach to politicians that you disagree with in, in terms of the word of God? Say, for instance, as Christians, we're, we're certainly against abortion. What about a campaign that goes after, not in a negative sense, but goes after pastor's heart, I mean, a, a politician's heart that is anti-abortion to, to try to help him to see 
uh, where God stands in that. You remember how Paul witnessed to Felix? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Felix who said, you almost convinced me to become a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what about that kind of tolerance where you're going after the person's soul right. rather than withdrawing from the person because their, their political differences are, are, well, are there. Well, attacking them is not going to help. No. You know, and so we got to find a way, you know, earn the right to Be tell right them our, our version, our, our way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're right. If you don't meet with them and you only ignore them, and you know, you're, you're not going to fix anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a there's certainly a helpful element of, because there are, I mean, there are pastors who, I, I don't know if they would argue in favor of abortion necessarily. I don't want to go that far. But you would have pastors who might say, these are the societal realities that make abortion something that is needed. I don't know if I want to go specifically with that. Try and find out why that pastor or why that politician, yeah. either or, because the pastors are speaking to those communities and, and seeing that as, as maybe not a necessity, but you know, something has to give somewhere because people are, people are, are sexually sinful and they are unrepentant and abortion just piles murder on top of that. Find out why do they believe that way? Like, why do they see that as something that should be a possibility? And I think you have to get to that part first, helping to, uh, finding out why the other person believes the way they believe, not necessarily to argue the point, but Look at it from their perspective. Try it and find out. That is completely missing in our political discourse in 99% in mm -hmm. of the cases. Mm -hmm. And, you know, be willing to be convinced of the other person's position. Doesn't mean it'll happen. Doesn't mean that you will, oh, gosh, you're right. I'm, I'm all for abortion now. But be willing <laughs> to have that conversation and say, okay, why, why do you think that way? Why is that a, a belief of yours? And... And, and go from there. And maybe you part as friends, maybe nothing changes, but at least you show as a follower of Christ that you're willing to have that dialogue because we're approaching a place where people aren't going to believe the way you believe in increasingly large numbers. And you're going to be able to have to have the ability intellectually, spiritually, emotionally to have those conversations. And when you treat the person with respect and you keep the lines of communication open, it gives opportunity for more conversation at a later date, maybe when they've had a, a change of heart. But if you call somebody evil, wicked, you shut it down, you attack them personally, and you have no ability to speak into their lives afterwards. Mm -hmm. You think about what you said, Billy Graham. Billy knew what he believed. He knew who he was, mm -hmm. and he met with anyone because what was his ultimate hope? That they would have an encounter with Jesus. That's right. That they would come to know Christ. And that was the only thing he didn't bend on and, 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 mm -hmm. and so to be all things to all people so that one mm -hmm. might be saved. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I, I, I do think that's a model that in this nation we as Christians should really look to. Um, you know, I, I'm not trying to hold him up as God, as God or anything of that nature. But, uh, but, you know, the, 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 the scripture in the Bible says that, well, before Christ left this earth to go back, he, he gave us a commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. That prayer has not been answered yet. He said, Lord, make them one as you and I are one. And uh, it, that means we can't get to heaven if we don't love one another. Mm -hmm. We're going to miss it. And look how close to the end we're getting. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, we're called right. to be kingdom amb ambassadors. Yeah. And sometimes we find our identity as a card carrying member of such and such <laughs> a political party. Yeah. And, and yeah. so when we begin to do that, we unfortunately trivialize uh, the message and the person that we're called to represent. And we well, read those passages about where Paul says, hey, there are, there are brothers and sisters in Christ that are engaged in some type of sin. They've been pushed out of the assembly until they repent so that they feel kind of that that pull of, of emptiness of without community. And, mm -hmm. and I, I am not advocating against that necessarily, but if, if you do that, one of the things that you have to ask yourself in this particular, some people have said post-Christian, post-modern environment, is how well is that working? Because typically what happens is you push someone away and they find a community that is just like them and they go to that community and then maybe they are really lost. Mm -hmm. So. 21st century problems require 21st century solutions. Yeah. Well, let's take a break. I, I, I hate to break away from this conversation. It's flowing so wonderfully, but let's take a break. We'll be right back and, and let's pick up where we left off. Stay with us.
Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pasture suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now, back to the discussion. All right, we're back to continue this spirited conversation we've been having. Uh, another viewer question that I wanted to call to your attention, gentlemen. This one says, churches need to be involved in real life needs of young people. I feel that the church should offer things like tutoring, financial management, and real life skills to those in need. But I rarely see churches offering something like this so that uh, well, some people are left to seek their direction in worldly sources instead of looking to the church. Right. How say you? Well, you know, I, you know, I was a youth pastor for a long time uh -uh. and I, I thought I was going to be a lifer and I wanted to be old guy hanging out with the kids because they're more fun than the old people. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I did all kinds of things for students during that time. But one of the greatest things, uh, the challenges of church then and now is, first of all, the greatest need of a kid is their personal relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And most churches can't even get enough help to get the religious instruction, mm -hmm. much less some of this social instruction. And, you know, churches aren't having youth pastors and youth groups like they were for a while. Uh, and part of it is, and I, I was a youth pastor and I was employed as one. I got to the point to where I was spending more time trying to help those kids than some of their parents were. And I think some parents are trying to relegate to the church what is their job. And honestly, religious instruction that doesn't start at the home probably isn't going to grow very far. That's right. If 93% of the so fathers come to the or if a father comes to church, 93% of the time their family will follow the Lord. If dad's not involved, only 7%. So the challenge is not giving all this to the kids. We got to help the parents to do their That's job right. yeah. and let the church do religious instruction. Yeah. Uh, honestly, who better to teach you how to manage your money than your mom and your dad? Who better to teach you some of these things? This person's asking about kids in need. There are some kids don't have that leadership. I get that, but I'm just, I'm not trying to justify it, but I'm just saying the church has a hard enough time doing religious instruction yeah. without trying to add some social elements, even though, yeah, it's a great idea, yeah. but let's not sell short where it really starts. The responsibility starts at home. So teach the parents to, to parent. To parent. Yeah. Well, and the saying. truth is we've all had this in our church where there's, I, I, if I had to guess, this question came from an older person looking to that younger generation. Go ask a 16 year old if they want to come to a money management course. At church. At your church. <laughs> Go ask the 14 year old why they didn't stop playing their video games with their friends and they didn't come to the, you know, X, Y, or Z, mm -hmm. the cooking or sewing class. Right. Because they don't want to. Right. And I have mm -hmm. to remind our folks constantly you know it's a good idea. The 16 year old doesn't care that it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So this idea that, the, well, the church has to do this. It's like, I would love to teach a finance. I can't get adults to come to a financial <laughs> management right. class. You want me to get a 14 year old yeah. who's right. working at Dairy Queen, <laughs> making eight bucks a pop? He doesn't yeah. have enough money to be financially managing it yet. I'm told by the way that this question came from a person that's 55 years old. Okay, so, so there you go. So that happens at times where we look and we know that they need it, amen. But the other thing, so, so if we know churches don't necessarily want to reach young folks the way they want to be reached. If you want to reach a kid right now and you're not doing it through their cell phone, you ain't reaching them. Right. Because mm -hmm. where do they spend their time? That's right. That's so right. if you really have this burden and this passion, I want to teach young people financial management. Well, you better be figuring out how to TikTok real quick <laughs> because <laughs> if you're not doing that, you're not going to teach them. So we have this idea of, well, they need to learn this and then they need to come and listen to me and sit in rows and, and do that. They're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. So even when we consider that, we have to consider the method in which we're going to try and do it and make sure that it matches up to the current generation. It's one of the hard parts of getting old and staying a youth pastor is understanding the latest trends. It's like you're doing what with who now and how are you connected and what words you just say, you know. All the kids are on this clock app. I hear about TikTok. I don't know what that, yeah. Yeah, what you is have TikTok? To, yeah. yeah, you have I'm to 55. keep up those things. <laughs> when, when I see a question like this, when churches need to be doing this and churches need to be doing that, uh, my, my instinct is to go to that person and say, okay, 
Are you going to lead that? <laughs> yeah. Because obviously it's something that they feel like is, is, is missing or they feel like the church should be involved in, which, okay, fine, whatever. Because there are those times where, you know, the church does serve as kind of that, that community gap. It ends up being the church or government. It's one of those two. So it should be. The Who church. would you prefer? Yep. You know, it's yeah. kind of what it comes down to. So sure, financial management, because we kind of focused in on that. Okay, are you going to lead that? You know, what? The, the pastor should not be doing everything. And that's just an unhealthy place for a pastor to be, mm -hmm. especially if it's a pastor that either doesn't have much of a staff or does have a smaller staff, but they're all doing their own stuff as well. And they're all doing things that are to be the primary goal, which is helping to disciple people and lead them to a greater relationship with Jesus Christ. So someone who wants to, to step up to the plate and teach financial management classes, absolutely. You know, that should, that should definitely be a part of it. But, you know, going on to your point as well, you have younger people who they, they, don't, they don't care about that kind of stuff yet. I, I was talking about financial peace here a couple of years ago, and there was another pastor who said, what if I don't care about my finances? Which I thought, well, I mean, you got a wife and a family and all this other kind of stuff. But they didn't, they were like, I don't want to do the, the things. I don't want to do the baby steps of Dave Ramsey. I don't want to do any of that kind of stuff. So why should I be involved in this class? So we probably shouldn't. And I'll take your money, by the way, too, <laughs> yeah, on top yeah. of that, since you're not too interested in it. But, yeah, it's that you have to have a real-world application to that. Like, the, the, the kids have to get to a point where it's like, man, it, it does matter that I don't blow all my money on Fortnite skins. Mm -hmm. And until they get to that point, all that stuff's just going to be noise. Should, should, getting back to uh, reaching the parent, uh, should we have Wednesday night classes and or perhaps Sunday school classes for parenting? that get into these issues. I mean, I, when my kids were younger, I remember my financial advisor told me once, he said, if you don't teach your kids to manage their money, they will be forever bumming off of you. <laughs> and that scared the living daylights out of me. It, I went home and I told my wife, I said, they're going to learn now. And I started. <laughs> and then lo and behold, I became a financial advisor after I left television news. And then I began to make sure that each of my kids had a, uh, had a bank account and that they set aside 10% for ties and they set aside another 10% for savings and before they could go out and buy gum and stuff like that. Yeah. But Bill, they're gonna listen to you way more than they're gonna listen to somebody else. That's why this stuff has to start at home. Yeah. And you know, I, I, I've tried to teach my kids and they learned at different levels, even in my own household. Mm -hmm. How much more diverse would it be trying to teach a whole classroom of students mm -hmm. at church? And, and, and or adults because they're coming from all kinds of backgrounds. And first of all, there's people in the church who don't even believe in tithing. So when you tell them they got a tithe, the parents will go, oh, you don't have to do that. He's just trying there's to get a raise. There's people in that don't know what that means. No, so you right, say you got a tithe right, and they go, right. what's that? Who's, who's tithe and what do I do with them? Right. So yeah. that's, that's the challenge. It's like, you know, uh, it, it's, it's easy to say we need all these things, a Wednesday night, Sunday school, all those things. The, the challenge goes back to who's going to do it, who's going to lead it. How, how do we, but how do we get parents to do I think you're, you're, you're on. I think something. you keep telling them what you just said. Yeah. If you want them bumming off you the rest of your life, don't teach them anything. Don't learn for yourself. But if you want them to be self-sufficient, not have to pay for their meals the rest of their life and buy them gas and car insurance, and you know some kids 30 years old, parents still paying their cell phone. Like, yeah. what's up with yeah. that? My parents didn't even pay for any of my cell phones because they didn't have them back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a postmodern culture too, there are so many fatherless homes. Yeah. This yeah. is an opportunity. And when I say the church, I don't mean a church program. I'm talking about seasoned saints stepping in and ministering to young people, getting into their lives. Again, this is where fellowship is important. And in that fellowship, in that relationship, you can begin to deposit things into young people's lives. Uh, and I think we tend to, we make the mistake when we think the church needs to offer this and the church needs to offer that. The church gets off mission many times when we try to become a catch-all for everything in society. We're called to present the gospel of Jesus and to prepare people for eternity, first and foremost. But as we're equipping believers to do the work of the ministry, which is what we should be doing as pastors, we can then release them to get into the lives of younger people. It's the Titus II model mm -hmm. with older women and younger women, older men and younger men, imparting wisdom mm -hmm. in sure. practical things into their lives. That's how we're going to build people young people into functioning adults in, in this postmodern society. Absolutely. Have, have we uh, yeah, okay. that? Okay. Um, <laughs> this, another part of this uh, question from another viewer, inflation, gas prices, and the cost of living are things that teenagers are dealing with 
not just adults, it says here, and this is creating more mental health issues. Do you notice that young people are being impacted oh, yeah. by mm -hmm. yeah. the cost That's of true. living? We talked about schools in the first segment. Kids were impacted by that immensely, and we tried to pretend as adults, well, no, they're resilient. No, they're not. Your kid will cry if you don't give them a snack. That's mm -hmm. not resilient. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we, we, we knew it was wrong, and we felt bad for it, so we just said it. Mm -hmm. Kids are really, really struggling. The one thing I think that we can point to our kids is you have to learn grit at some point in your life. This was thrust upon you. So you've got to learn to kind of dig in and overcome at some points. And you're dealing with some of the hard things in life. There's no one who doesn't live through inflation and, and gas prices and struggle with the economy and stuff. That's part of life. So it teaches them at least hopefully while they're still in your house and mom and dad can give them a grid for it. But the same way an adult handles inflation, gas prices, cost of living, we got to teach our teenagers to do that. And first, it starts with a personal relationship with God. Again, the church's role in all of this is to help people know God is with you. He said, I've told you these things. They're, so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, we're going to have trouble. We're going to have trials, tribulation. But take heart, he's overcome the world. Get them to Jesus. Get them strong in, in their faith. Doesn't mean they're not going to struggle with any of these issues, mental health issues, uh, depression. But you know, when you know where your help comes from, mm -hmm. you've got a lot more strength and a lot more courage to handle some of the stuff, the challenges that we all face. And uh, so let's get them to Christ. And, and remember he supplies our needs. He's the one that yeah. gets us through the tough stuff. Yeah. I have been uh, focusing on a study the last several months on Sunday mornings on foundational Christian doctrines and have felt led to uh, talk of eschatology over the last number of weeks. And a couple of the key things that I've wanted to share, especially with our young people, is the theme of hope in the midst of this chaos that, you know, masks and COVID and wars and all of this, is that our hope is found in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, a secondary theme that I've wanted to share in that is Titus 2.13, we're to be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the end, if we stay faithful to Him, we win. And that gives us perspective. It doesn't cause us to, to, to be fearful and to hide. It gives us perspective to persevere throughout the trials and tribulations. Very good. And, and on that note, I think we'll have to end it. We're, we're just about out of time. Um, very good. And I, I appreciate all the comments that you've had to say. You've given our audience a lot of things to think about, to pray about and talk about. In the final analysis, I think that what you said is, is true, is we've got to get young people, middle-aged people, older people to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Thank you again for being with us today. Be sure you tune in again next week and every week at this time for our program. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.